This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. One. Ah, uh, there he is, Lou Pudirisi. <coughs> this is energy in America, and it's actually energy right here in Hawaii because I, I have to reveal to you that Lou is here in Hawaii. And he's on a trip, uh, but we're still talking to him remotely because we like to talk to Lou remotely. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi, welcome back to the show. I'm great. It's great to be here, Jay. I'm uh, very happy to be here because uh, my son is graduating on Saturday from UH Manoa. So, <laughs> is he, what is he and studying? He can find a job soon. <laughs> oh well, send Pardon? him our way. We can offer him, you know, some <laughs> contract work on a part-time basis. <laughs> If you need a Chinese speaker, he'll be good for you. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, it's that kind of degree. Then. <laughs> so, uh, where, are you? You're in a hotel, or you're in the airport? Where are you? I'm uh, out in the beautiful western uh, province of Oahu, mm -hmm. called Koalina. Ah, okay, we know. Where, that. thankfully, the Chinese money has flowed slow enough that there's no construction, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the prices are still manageable. <laughs> Prices are still managed. I'm in a condominium. Ah. It's quite nice. So, okay, I hope to see you while you're here. But uh, uh, today, let's follow our discussion of last week, where we or two weeks ago, where we talked about the uh, climate change assessment report that was issued uh, by by the government, actually through the White House, um, where um, your your view of it was that we should not we should not be alarmed. And we should look at it uh, in a sort of moderated way and not, not, not take the uh, worst case analysis, but um, look at, look at um, other options as well. And this is a kind of continuation right. of that discussion. So, uh, sure. I think one, one of the things I'd like to get into, I mean, if you, if you think about the discussion last time, really it wasn't that, I don't know if alarm is the word, but that even in the worst case scenario, there was plenty of data to suggest it was a manageable. Uh, it was a manage. It might not be an, an uh, outcome everyone likes, but it's a, it's an issue that we do have the resources to manage. Mm -hmm. I think that was the bottom line of that. And I, what I'd like to do today is sort of perhaps at the end of the year, it's good to look back and think about uh, not just all the bad news we get every day, but what, what you know what kind of achievements have been taken place on the environmental side, particularly the U.S., which has done a remarkable job in cleaning up the air. And I think that it kind of lays the foundation for that we can look to technology to do a lot of things going forward. It has done a very good job to us today. But I think, once again, we need to look at the data. Yeah. And as you so. said before the show began, uh, it's probably better not to run around like your hair was on fire. Right. I mean, as we say, whenever we have a meeting, uh, in God we trust, but everyone else has to bring data. So, <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> well, okay. So let's, uh, I, let's I, take a look. Yeah, now, now uh, there's data and there's data, of course, so you have to tell us where you're getting it from. <laughs> Absolutely. We publish our data, and I will, most of this data comes from the EPA. Okay, all right. <laughs> and we do have slides, don't we? We do, of course. We always have slides. <laughs> all right. So the first the first slide uh, uh, shows uh, a comparison of economic growth and uh, emissions, air emissions, and we'll get into this in a little more detail later, but between 1970 and 2017. And I think what you want to look at, this is quite a very interesting picture of U.S. industrial activity and uh, our air quality. So our GDP from 1970 has grown uh, 267%. So it's growing. We, our national economy has expanded quite a bit. Not everyone has benefited from that expansion, but uh, uh, our vehicle miles traveled, you know, VMT, very popular number. Uh -huh. uh, it has uh, increased about 189% since 1970. You can see the green line. Uh -huh. And uh, our population is up 59%. Mm -hmm. And even our energy consumption since 1970 is up. You can notice a lot of these uh, things are flattening population energy consumption. Yeah. But aggregate emissions of six common pollutants, these are the so-called criteria pollutants. We'll get into them a little bit more in the show, but 
These are things like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, uh, lead, uh, the kinds of things that EPA controls, not only the emissions of them, but they go around and measure the ambient standard in the atmosphere around your home, in your neighborhood. And so um, in industrial activities, automobiles, tailpipe emissions, everyone has to meet sort of two things. Communities have to have the ambient standards, which are just measurements of what's in the air. And in addition, new facilities and old facilities as well must also control the amount of emissions which go into the atmosphere. These are the two basic building blocks of how we control and improve the air quality in the United States. Okay, help me with this figure. It says economic sure. growth and declining emissions from 1970 to 2017. But if I look yeah, at the, right. uh, the, the graphics on the right-hand side, I see a line of, uh, you know, as you said, gross domestic product and, and a line of uh, vehicle miles traveled. Where's where's the right. declining emission emissions? I don't I don't see the that. very bottom one aggregate emissions of six common pollutants, ah. and you see here is declined by seventy three percent. And we'll get into this in a little more detail. Okay, go ahead. But I don't think a lot of people understand that. And actually, there are kinds of this is a kind of, you know if you go back a couple a few years ago. Um, I think that uh, there was an interesting statement by Lisa Jackson, the head of EPA. And she said, we're actually at the point uh, in many areas of the country that on a hot day, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, you, you shouldn't go outside because the air could kill you. Okay. <laughs> and meanwhile, we have a, a, a separate study done by uh, Stephen Hayward at the American Enterprise Institute who said that one of the largest public policy success stories is the dramatic improvement of our nation's air quality. Now, everyone has an act to grind. And I think that a big, a big issue at EPA is they have a hard time uh, accepting their success often because I think they're concerned. People say, well, if we succeed in this, we don't need to give you any more money to do more. But I mean, I, I'm not sure what, what, why, you know, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the, treatment around uh, the public, you know, public perception and, and government officials on environment is that we really can't tell the public that we're making a lot of progress because they, they might lose their enthusiasm for doing some of the things we want to do. So let's get a little more detail in this. Let's look at uh, the next slide, I can get, which is, I, I think this is, this is more about just a picture, right? And I think this is something people forget, right? If you go to Pittsburgh, California, which actually, I mean, yeah, in, 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 in 19, well, no, this is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, around, Pennsylvania. 1940, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you can see the uh, difference in, uh, uh, you know, particulates in the atmosphere, shall we say, in, in 1940 as compared to 2017. Now, we're going to show some data that supports this, but anyone who says the air hasn't gotten cleaner is just crazy. I mean, this is where we had unbridled emissions of particulates from coal-fired plants, steel mills, cement uh, cement manufacturing facilities. Well, I, I, what and I get is the, that Pittsburgh is in the middle of the steel belt. Pittsburgh, uh, yeah. you know, had a tremendous amount of steel production back in, in the 40s. It was the center of steel production in the country. Um, and on the right-hand side picture, uh, that's really beautiful, clean air. On the other hand, there's not so much steel production in Pittsburgh anymore. The Chinese are so making So I would agree. Steel. Right. Part of this is, of course, the change of the structure, of the industrial structure of the United States. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But we also have widespread uh, implementation of emission control technologies. I mean, I'm going to show you some data at the end of this along the Gulf Coast, right, where we have massive uh, petrochemical facilities. And I think you'll be quite surprised what it shows about the nature of air quality, even in that region. So it would be, it's a legitimate point, but we can't discount the huge role of emission control technology. And emission control technology, which has been possible because of our prosperity, but also because of advancing technology. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're pretty good at this stuff. You know? mm -hmm. we, we forget that we're pretty good at it. 
All right, let's let's go to. Uh, we talked before. Uh, it's called Figure Three A. There's a three B, but I'm not showing it to you because uh, we don't have enough time. But uh, in Figure Three A, these are ambient concentrations of pollutants from 1970. 1990 to 2017. Uh-huh. Same and period of time. The ba- it's the same yeah, period so of time as the other chart you showed us. Right. right. And, and what I want to point out, uh, I, there's a couple of things about this chart, and you can go to uh, the EPA website and dig this data up yourself. It's quite easy. And they, they have pretty good measurement. Now, if you look at the legend at the bottom, um, one thing a lot of people don't understand about pollution is that it depends how you measure it. And some, monet- and, and some standards require that uh, you meet a certain ambient concentration over a period of time. And that period of time could be one hour, eight hours, one year. So the standards are not, they're not just a one-year standard. You have to meet these standards in even shorter periods of time. And if you think about it, you can violate, you could meet the standard all year, but still violate several times during the year for just an hour. And yeah. EPA measures all that. And that's why this very uh, kind of spaghetti looking chart has so many lines in it. So if you go to the bottom, you see PB, three months. So that's a concentration of lead on average over a three month period. But carbon monoxide is over an eight hour period. Nitrogen oxide is an annual number. But there's also data here on nitrogen oxide over a one-hour period, right? Uh, O3, which is ozone, which is a precursor to smog, they do that in an eight-hour period. And then the infamous PM2.5, now particulate matter of 2.5 microns or less. Now, PM2.5 is the basic uh, criteria pollutant which is affiliated most with breathing problems, with bad air quality. Uh-huh. Some over 75% of the measured health benefits of air quality control is reductions in PM2.5. It's the most expensive regulation in the federal government. Most people don't understand this. There's lots of other things. There's PM10, and of course, the 10 microns, and then sulfur dioxide. And what I want you to see from this table is you can see that, uh, yes, the, uh, the uh, lead, you can see lead, the red line, sort of, they don't measure all the time, but it came just, you know, lead concentrations are practically zero. We got rid of, rid of lead and gasoline, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, uh, our PM2.5 is way down. The only thing that seems to have flattened out a bit is ozone, you know, the green line there. You can see it's sort of flat. Mm-hmm. But most of these are moving... Nitrogen oxides are, you know, they have come down, they've sort of flattened out, but they are at substantial below the level, uh, uh, below the national ambient air quality standards, right? So we have this lower reduction, and we're going to get into show what, what that means for the, for the country as a whole in a second. Mm-hmm. But I mean, basically, we have very good technology out there, tail pipe emissions and in so-called... Uh, uh, industrial facilities to control these emissions, to capture them and dispose of them in different mm-hmm. ways. Well, that certainly sounds like what you said it was going to sound like. Good news for Christmas uh, in, in this it's season. Good news for Christmas. Yeah, good news yeah. for Christmas. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, uh, when we come back from this break, Lou, uh, let's, mm-hmm. let's see what the implications are. Um, and let's see if that really affects, uh, you know, by the scientific analysis uh, climate change. Clearly, these charts show there's been either a reduction or a flatlining of, uh, you know, of new emissions into the into the atmosphere. On the other hand, uh, what does that mean, and how does that affect uh, our our lives together on this planet going forward? Ooh, exciting questions. We'll have this short break. <laughs> we'll come right back. That's Lou Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of Eprink, and he's in Honolulu right now, which is a real treat. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom, is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. 
Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Island. One. We're back, we're live. We're Lou Pugliarisi, CEO of eBrink. He's here in Honolulu. We're on energy in America, and we're talking about good news in the environment for Christmas. So, Lou, you had some more charts <laughs> you wanted to show us. And yes, let's go to figure four. And these show you uh, the concentrations of, this is weighted by population, which we won't spend a lot of time explaining, but concentrations of PM2.5. Now, um, if you go to Beijing or Nanjing, Every cab driver knows what the concentrations of PM 2.5 are. It's something they pay a lot of attention to, environmental awareness. And this is not a climate issue. This is an issue of particulates in the atmosphere. And uh, I think that was an F-22 just flew over. Okay, so if you look here, on, and, and there's been some very interesting writing in the Atlantic about India, how, like the worst polluted country in the world. And you can see this concentration of PM2.5, mm -hmm. which is, for India, which is the top line, right? It's just off the charts. Uh, it's even worse than it, China. Mm -hmm. Globally, it's quite bad. Where is the U.S. on this chart? Our levels are down at 10 or below. Okay. Mm -hmm. 10 or below is the level the World Health Organization states as the most healthy air. And we have it. We have it in the U.S. And we burn, you know, we still burn a lot of coal. We still have a lot of industrial activity. But we have very good air control, very good uh, air quality, emission control technology in this country. And our prosperity is one of the reasons we have that. Now, there are co and, other uh, countries below us, isn't it? It's just that they're not shown on this chart. Okay, yeah, maybe Sweden and, uh, and uh, some uh, Iceland and uh, some other northern European country where there's just a bunch of reindeer running around. It's possible that they're better than us. <laughs> I think they are. But once you get down to 10, that's pretty low. It that's is, pretty okay. low. And I'll show you. And I'll show you a heat map of that in a second. Ah. Okay. So now if you go to figure five, figure five shows what's called on-site air releases of pollutants. Now, notice this is broken up into two categories. Fugitive air emissions, right? And this is really inside baseball stuff for air pollution people. And stack air emissions. So stack air emissions are uh, emissions that come out of a power plant, like a utility or a cement, a cement plant or a steel facility. Right? Those are any industrial facility has a stack, and up that stack goes all these criteria pollutants. And then they're so-called fugitive air emissions, where we're not exactly sure where they're coming from. Automobiles, re-entrained road dust, uh, could just be naturally formed ozone. And as you can see, the U.S. at the site, uh, we have done a very good job of continuing to reduce through 2016 our uh, on-site releases. Those are millions of pounds of criteria pollutants. Does it include CO2? And then let's move to our final slide, right? Okay, can, before, we go, show, before we go there, before we go there, yeah, can, can, sure. you, can yeah. you explain the difference between the dark blue and the light blue? Uh, right, the dark blue is stuff that goes up a smokestack. And the light blue is everything else, like maybe a dry cleaner or an automobile or a... Uh, what they call fugitive air emissions, even some naturally occurring ozone occurs in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. They're called fugitive because they, they, you can't control them at the source. Another thing is non-source emissions, right? We don't know, we sort of know that most of that's automobiles, but there's other stuff mm -hmm. out there. And well, the, uh, that, that seems to be pretty steady on this chart, uh, but the, uh, what is it, the stack? Uh, 2015, yeah, but you're coming down to a low level for the country. You know? You've gotten down to a low level. There are levels at which you can't drive it any lower, which, unless you want to just live I in see. a cave. You know, just okay. okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Now, now we go to the last one. 
Figure six shows the average populated weighted exposure to PM2.5 in 2016. And th th this is measured in micrograms per cubic meter, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think is very interesting about this table is this is the data from the World Health Organization, 2018. Okay. You can see the green is 10 or less, right? This is the most healthy. The World Health Organization states that this is healthy air. This is very good air, right? And you can see the U.S. and Canada are pretty good. I think what's interesting about this are well-meaning and often lecturing us European our, uh, European. Uh, partners on our, uh, you know, how bad we are with the environment. Uh, if you will notice, they, they, their PM2.5 numbers don't even come close to the U.S. I mean, they're better than China and parts of Africa, but uh, in the Middle East. But we're, we're our whole country on an annual rate is sitting under uh, two point, uh, you know. Under 10 micrograms. Well, this is really interesting. And, that, you don't... and this, even along the Gulf Coast of the United States, there's a little bit of pocket there in California, but if you look how green it is on the southern Gulf Coast of the United States, and we have massive facilities there, petrochemical plants and refineries, mm. and we're able to control that with our technology. Mm. Very important. So I th You need to spend money on technology. I think that uh, this, the term population weighted has to be explained to understand this chart because... Uh, so this just means uh, you, ne you need to also adjust it for the density of the population. Now, what percentage of the population is in the highly polluted area? So if you're going to do a big average number for the year, um, and so the U.S. has a big land mass, so we don't have, we're not as densely populated as some other countries. So the um, the number of people who are subjected to bad air is much smaller than in Delhi, mm. where not only do they have bad air, they have a lot of people. Mm. So I think it's a kind of uh, adjusted per capita basis. But I'm happy to uh, uh, send you the thousand page WHO report. <laughs> <laughs> no, just just take me through the analysis by which Africa, which has very few people relative, you know, to I guess Europe, uh, why Africa is all um, so on, on the darker side. Burning, yeah, so um, Africa is burning lots of biomass, right? Biomass like wood, dung, and if you want to generate a lot of particulates in the atmosphere. You, you know, cook or be on an open fire or on a, uh, using cow dung or very primitive forms of power generation or even cooking. Right? So this is adding to your PM 2.5. They also have a lot of uh, very small dust in those areas having to do with the natural phenomena in those parts of the world. But, mm -hmm. uh, and, and why Siberia? Not just the why is Siberia up at, uh, what is it? 11 to 15, it looks, Siberia looks healthy, but yeah, why, no, why is it not completely to, green? Because, because there are big nickel plants, and uh, Russia is an industrial country. Many people forget, even in, the, even in Siberia, there's a lot of petroleum development, and there, there are no emission controls in Russia, really, to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, very, so, very interesting. Uh, you, you, yeah, yeah. And you can see China, Asia, Asia is, is suffering a lot from this. And also the U.S. is benefiting not just from our technology, but the growth in natural gas. And natural gas combustion has no particular mm -hmm. to speak of. I mean, it's very limited. Okay. Uh, so. very, you, know, you look at a world map like that, it's very yeah. interesting. Right, right. And that, I, I, I don't... I don't want... I don't think you can crosswalk from this to CO2 control necessarily. But... It is important to recognize that when we put our best people on something and we put our technology to work, it can deliver. I do think the CO2 problem is a little tougher. It's a long, you know, it, it, it's more expensive. It may take a lot longer, but there's no, I, I don't see any real obstacle for us eventually uh, bringing uh, CO2 emissions and addressing the consequences of CO2 
CO2 does not lend itself as easily to emission control, right? It requires, in some cases, very costly alternatives. But as shown in France, people are not really yet, yet really oh, that's, for. that's a whole other phenomenon worth talking about. All right. Uh, so, okay, so we, we have, you know, emissions through technology, emissions can be held or reduced. And we have demonstrated that. You have demonstrated that on these charts from the EPA. Um, but but how, does that, how does that affect the temperature rise we have had over the extraordinary rise over the past year or two? And how, does it, how is it going to affect that rise uh, in the years First, to come? First, I would not be, because I am not, if you're talking about the climate record of the U.S., I'm very reluctant to draw any big conclusions from two years' worth of data, even 100 years' worth of data. Yes, climate is a real problem. I agree that it's a real problem. Uh, but I also believe that uh, prosper that you need prosperity and economic growth to deal with climate, because it's an expensive problem. Right? Mm. And that we need to get a little less hysterical about it and a little more practical about how we're going to proceed. And the first thing we need to do is agree where's the low-hanging fruit and go after that. But I have a feeling that the political debate over climate is either, if you're, you're either with me to get rid of all fossil fuels and to move into a cave, or you're not. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the fight we need to have. And I, actually, I don't think that's the fight we need to have. And that's part of the problem is the debate is kind of, concentrated in the public's mind by these extremes, right? You can't be a lukewarmer and get very far. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I, you know what I'm getting, Lou? I'm, I'm getting the fact that yeah. uh, we, you know, there, there we had a show, uh, was it yesterday, on carbon, the carbon tax, as it, it might conceivably, yeah. uh, you know, be adopted in Hawaii, but it hasn't been adopted uh, anywhere else in the U.S., and, and it hasn't right. been adopted in Europe. Uh, well, it has been adopted in one or two places in Europe, but not much. Good. And so, you know, what, what I get, I mean, and we forget about sea level rise for a moment, just, uh, you know, yeah. a, about climate change in general. Um, th not that much has happened because we haven't, we meaning, the, the, you know, the people who are concerned about it, whether they were alarmist or not so alarmist, um, that they, we haven't been able to convince government to do anything much. So it's not like government is pouring money on this. It's not. In anywhere in the world, it's not. And so what you have is whatever the situation is, whatever these numbers are, whatever the emissions are, whatever the temperature is, whatever the report says, whether it's alarmist or not, uh, we haven't really done anything. Uh, so I, I can understand when the scientists come around and say, oh, you guys, this is so scary. In part, they are saying, and these... The national assessment is saying, you know, you should be a little alarmist because if you're a little alarmist, then you, maybe you'll take a little action. <laughs> that's that's the problem. <laughs> but there is a problem, right? It's not so. If you, if you go around, I mean, one of the interesting things on this air pollution story is that if you fix air pollution in Beijing, Nanjing, and Delhi, and uh, Hanoi, and, and in Myanmar, if you fix air pollution there. You're going to do something for carbon. Mm, yeah. It may not be. You're going to do something for carbon because they're related in a sense. Yes. They're because they're driven by coal. They're driven by huge amounts of coal use. Uh, but there's other issues of water, air quality, water, and so the the discussion nobody wants to have, which yeah. is okay. What is the most cost of what the cost effective thing society should do? And to, in order to improve its environment, where should it spend its money? Mm. Is that something that we're going to do? It's a hard we're question. We're going to make a trade-off. Yeah. So you, someone needs to say, well, no, we should stop all this other stuff and just just go for climate 100. percent Well, people like clean water too. People like the, they, they they want control, and people like low electricity prices. Yeah. I mean, you put a carbon tax. You put a carbon tax, and uh, I mean, if you think about petroleum, we've talked about this before. Most of the petroleum barrel, 80% is going into transportation fuels. And transportation fuels worldwide, except in a few isolated places in the Middle East, are, tra are, are taxed at anywhere from $50 to $250 a ton, right? 
They just call them excise taxes, but they're doing that now. So the real question is, what are you going to do about coal? Well, that's my view. What are you going to do about coal? Are you going to have a program that slowly reduce? Because that's where the real return is. All this nonsense people are doing in Hawaii to get rid of a little bit of fuel oil, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's not yielding anything to the global environment. Right? It's too it, small. It has, it, it, yeah, it's too small, and it's, and it's ridiculous. It would be better to donate that money to get rid of a coal-fired power plant in China, okay? Well, this, this raises a huge question, which we've skirted, you and me, in our discussions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, we, and we will not have enough time to talk about it now. Maybe, maybe the next time we can get together. And that is, how, how do you develop governance on this? If you leave it to a voluntary federation of some states but not others, some countries but not others, to take action, and you, you have no way of coordinating it, no way of saying you should do this, that, and the other thing in these priorities. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to say we, we have lots of trouble taking any action if we're not coordinated. And there's right now, there's no global way to coordinate it. COP24, completely voluntary, and it's vulnerable, you know, to political and geopolitical whims and other issues. So I, I say, I say, um, if you want to take action, we have to have a better structure, call it a, a governmental structure, a global governmental structure to fix this stuff. Like a world Otherwise, government. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think that world government is going to go over well in Washington. But it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm raising the point. But we do need it. You're absolutely right. You have a quote, quote, free rider problem. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, Hawaii could do everything. You go 100% renewable. And all you have done is spent a ton of money and done nothing. <laughs> if nobody else comes along. <laughs> well, everybody's got to work on this. It's got to be a global, a global solution. Right. To a it's global got to be problem. global. I agree. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we should discuss this uh, soon on one of our next programs. In the meantime, while you're here, Lou, I, I want to I wanna direct your attention to the clean air. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much all I around am, you. I'm enjoying it. I hope you enjoy it. I can see it. it in my window. <laughs> <laughs> and for that matter, the clean water. And, and it's, it's exactly. we still have the right thing here. <laughs> <laughs> and when you look up, look at, look at the, uh, uh, the lights on the ceiling. They're on. <laughs> we do have electricity. <laughs> and if you look around to the rooms, you'll see a, a lot of... Uh, Those are just tank. studio lights. Do you want to see the view out my window? I'll show you this. Sure, okay. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Life in, life in couple A. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Lou. <laughs> That's Lou Pugliarisi having a wonderful time here in Hawaii, enjoying himself. Uh, in the days Good. before Christmas, thank you for bringing these Christmas treats to us. This data that suggests <laughs> our environment is is okay and through technology. Thank you so much, Lou. Hope to talk okay, to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Aloha.